Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Irene and I'm a registered dietitian and today's pediatric nutrition case study is on the topic of refeeding syndrome. So first and foremost, let's go over what refeeding syndrome is. Refeeding syndrome is a very serious condition in which individuals that are malnourished or have been undernourished for an extended period of time may experience fluid or electrolyte shifts after refeeding or reinitiation of nutrition that may lead to very serious metabolic and clinical complications. Now on to the case study. As always, this case study is 100% made up and the patient slash family is fictional, but maybe based on some of my previous experiences. Experiences. Patient D is a 14 year old male with history of autism. He was admitted for dehydration and mom reports that he has not eaten in a week. At baseline, mom reports that he usually eats very well, but family is aware that his diet is very unhealthy. Family has worked on expanding the patient's acceptability of other foods, but they have not seen very much progress even with feeding therapy. Patient's anthropometric measurements are 100 kilos weight and 170 centimeters height. Patient's mom reports that at the last PCP visit two months ago, patient's weight was around 240 pounds or 109.1 kilos and this is pretty normal for him. So first and foremost we're going to look at his anthropometric measurements and we will plug this into PV tools. So he is a 14 year old male and that I believe comes out to 168 months. His weight is 100 kilos and his height is 170 centimeters and we are using the CDC 2 to 20 year old growth curve for this. So here are his anthropometric measurements. He is in the 100th percentile for his weight, 78th percentile for his height, and his BMI is in the 99th percentile. So based off of this information, he does look a little bit overweight. However, he has had some weight loss in the past couple of months. So mom reported that he was 240 pounds at his normal weight around two months ago. So if we are looking at weight loss, we would take his usual body weight and subtract that by his current weight. So his weight change was a loss of 9.1 kilos over the last two months. And we always want to look at weight loss in terms of percentages. You take that and you divide the weight loss by his usual weight, so 109.1 and this gives a percentage. You always multiply that by 100. So he had weight loss of 8.3% in the last two months. And taking all of this together, his weight loss with his current weight and BMI percentile, we're not really going to focus on losing weight, at least inpatient. That's something that they can always work on outpatient. So my goal for him is weight maintenance of at least 95% of his admit weight. Now, in terms of his nutrition status, because he's had this weight loss that actually means that he is moderately malnourished because remember from 7.5 up to 10 percent weight loss is moderate malnutrition so even though he may be considered overweight he is still considered malnourished because of this drastic weight loss that was unintentional okay so now we have a little bit of history on this patient and we will go and talk with family so mom reports that patient has a very limited diet he only eats chips french fries bananas and soda and all of his meals meals and snacks are a combination of these foods. They have tried feeding therapy before and not really seen any benefits and family is continuing to try and offer other foods and family is also aware that this is very unhealthy but unfortunately with a lot of kids with autism I see this a lot. They just have such strong feeding aversions and it's not something that they can just get over overnight and it really takes like a lot of a lot of feeding therapy and speech therapy to help them get through that and it may take years even 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 though like his diet isn't super healthy, I know that with his autism that that's like a huge factor. I'm not really going to want to spend time to educate family on healthy eating or, or weight management. They are fully aware of that and that's also not an inpatient problem at the moment. He's here because he has not eaten anything in a week. So my main priority is not like giving him a healthy diet. It's we need to get him some nutrition. So mom also reports that patient does not have any known food allergies or dietary restrictions and he is not on any vitamins or supplements at home. So based off of what mom is telling me, I can guess that he likely short term has not been meeting his calorie goals given that he's had a lot of weight loss. If he had been gaining weight 
or maintaining his weight appropriately, I would have said that he had been meeting his calorie goals. I don't really spend time to calculate out about how much he's actually taking in in a day because I think that that can be really hard. It depends on like what brand of food you're buying, like the package size, all this stuff. And it's really not worth my time to try and figure that out. I think that we have a lot of predictive equations that can help us with that. They're not perfect, but they give us a great starting point and that is what I'm going to use to estimate his needs. So I am going to use the TEE for him. So last year they actually came out with some new TEE and EER equations and this is what I am going to use. I haven't really used them a lot yet just because I pretty recently found out that they came out with new ones. So because he is a 14 year old boy, we are going to use one of these equations. I feel like for most patients I tend to default to using the inactive equation because at least while they're in the hospital they're not really moving around a whole ton so I tend to find that this does pretty well at least in the inpatient setting. If there was a patient that was very active like maybe they were doing sports at school and things like that I may want to look into using the active or the very active equations but for the most part I kind of default to the inactive one and if we find that patients aren't gaining weight appropriately or losing weight, you can always adjust from there. So for patient D, we're just going to take all of his information and plug it into the equation. Okay, so we get 3,131 kcals per day, and in peds, we typically like to do everything per kilogram, so I'm just gonna divide that by his weight. So we get 31 kcals per kilogram. So I'm gonna estimate his needs around this 31 kcals per kilogram. So I will say that his range is gonna be from 29 to 33. So 31 is kind of just right there in the middle. As for his fluid needs, typically in pediatrics, we use Holiday Seeger, but if we take a look at his weight so 100 minus 20 times 20 plus 1500 that's gonna give us 3100 and so this pretty much is right around where his calorie needs are as well so it's kind of just like per every one kcal you need one milliliter of fluid and that's kind of how we did it in adults however I know that when I first started in pediatrics I was kind of just taught that even if you get a bigger number in holiday seeger you kind of just max out at 2400 and I don't know exactly the reason for this like I don't have an article that was just kind of what I was taught so for him though he is pretty big and I feel like he does probably need more fluid so I'm probably gonna shoot somewhere within this range. In my note, I might say like 2400 to 2900-ish and try and meet somewhere within there. There's a lot of kind of like gray area here and it kind of just depends on the individual patient and if they have any other conditions, like any renal conditions or cardiovascular conditions that could affect what their water needs are. Now for him, I am probably going to recommend starting Entral Nutrition because this kid is probably not going to eat on their own. They've had a whole week at home where they haven't been eating. And so being in the hospital, that's definitely not going to make them want to eat. I will definitely talk with the team and ask them, hey, are you considering dropping an NG tube? Most of the times they already are. And if we are starting Entral Nutrition, we really need to be cautious of refeeding syndrome. Even if he's overweight, because he is A, moderately malnourished now, and B, has not been eating for a week. Going back to what refeeding syndrome is, malnutrition and undernutrition for a prolonged time, these things put him at risk. And I have 100% seen kids that are overweight refeed, even on small amounts of feeds, because they haven't gotten nutrition in so long. So it is definitely possible. They don't necessarily like think that overweight people will refeed, but they do. And I have seen it before, legitimately. Their electrolytes drop the next time you check them and they require a lot of repletion and everything. So if the residents or the doctors are kind of fighting on this, they really need to check their weight biases. It's not always people that are, you know, look super malnourished that refeed. They do a lot of the times, but other people can too, regardless of their body size. Because he's 14, I'm just gonna pretty much start with Jevity. If you are not an Abbott contracted hospital, you might use something else. I forget what the Nestle one is, but I'm gonna use Jevity 1.0. It's a standard intact protein formula with fiber in it. And one annoying thing about Jevity though is it's a 1.0 formula, but 
it's technically like 31.5 kcals per ounce. In each carton, it's 237 milliliters, but it's 250 calories. So I'm just gonna calculate how much formula he pretty much needs. The way that I like to do it is kind of like kcals per ounce or kcals per milliliter. So 250 calories per 237 ounces. So that is technically what the kcals per milliliter is not exactly 1.0 and it kind of drives me insane but whatever that's just like the ocd part of me anyways so 3100 divided by that So we will need 2,939 milliliters. And I kind of like to round if I can. So I might just say 2,940 milliliters of formula. And so we will probably be starting on a continuous rate because we are worried about refeeding syndrome. So we wanna go really slow. And if we're calculating out our goal 24 hour continuous feed rate, it comes out to 122.5. Now, I don't love this number, I kind of love even numbers so let's see what like 120 times 24 gives us so 2880 and if we multiply that by how many calories that's going to give us it gives us a little bit over 3,000 calories that's still going to be within our range so our range for him is 29 to 33 calories per kilogram so i'm okay with this it's going to be like a pretty easy number to like calculate with so let's go ahead and just use 2880 milliliters as our total volume goal that also gives us 120 milliliters per hour for 24 hours which is a really easy goal rate to calculate with when we were when we are concerned with refeeding syndrome we want to advance very slowly and the rule of thumb is to advance by no more than 20 to 25 percent of his estimated needs each day so day one you're going to want to start with 20 to 25 percent of his estimated needs if his goal is 120 milliliters per hour we're going to advance to no greater than 30 milliliters per hour day two we will advance to no greater than 60 milliliters per hour day three we will advance by no greater than 90 milliliters per hour and then day four is when we will finally get to goal there are some cases where if you're not as concerned about refeeding but you still want to be cautious you might choose to do 33 percent 33 percent and then goal but that kind of depends on the situation for him i'm fairly concerned so i'm going to want to take this very slowly so looking at my recommendations i am going to list out all of these goals and let the team know that we don't want to go past these because of his risk of refeeding syndrome and this actually works out fairly nicely too because if we start at 10 and advance by 10 every eight hours so that'll be three advancements in a 24-hour period that actually gets him pretty much to the goal by the end of the 24-hour period and we can just keep going up by 10 every eight hours another thing that we're going to want to look at is his free water needs so in the jevdy formula 198 milliliters of the 237 in each carton is is water so that means that the formula is 83.5 percent water and we are giving him a total of 2880 milliliters that means he's getting about 2400 milliliters of free water from his formula and i know earlier we said we kind of wanted a little bit higher free water because he's a larger kid i'm gonna kind of want to shoot for closer to 2400 to 3000 milliliters a day and i kind of give a range and sometimes i leave this up to the team to kind of decide how much free water they want to give so I'll suggest 100 to 600 milliliters of free water. This will get to about 2,500 to 3,000 milliliters of free water a day, and they can kind of split that up however they want to. I also did give a bolus goal as well if this kid ends up having to go home on NG tube feeds. A bolus regimen might be more helpful because then you don't have to be tied to the pump the whole time. So his total volume of 2,880 kind of really divides nicely into six bolus feeds of 480 milliliters and that just means that it's 16 ounces at each time so you can really just give about two cartons six times a day and then with each feed you can also give water flush and so i suggest about 90 milliliters each time so three ounces of water i feel like that that's fairly reasonable if you're thinking about a kid that's kind of on the larger side you should be able to tolerate this volume run over 30 minutes to an hour once he's a little bit better and then the last recommendation that i have is regarding refeeding syndrome so we want to make sure that that we are checking labs diligently 
typically we'll check them every six to 12 hours once they're kind of past 50 percent of their needs we can kind of space them out a little bit more to like once a day it kind of depends on how they're doing if they're if their kfos or mag is dropping every time we're checking labs and you probably don't want to be spacing them out however if they're relatively stable we can definitely space them out kfos and mag potassium phosphorus and magnesium are the three main electrolytes that we are concerned about when it comes to refeeding syndrome so these are the electrolytes that we're definitely going to want to make sure that we check the severity of refeeding syndrome depends on how much these electrolytes are dropping so typically if there is a 10 to 20 percent drop it's considered mild refeeding syndrome if it's 20 to 30 percent it's moderate refeeding and if it's 30 percent or more that is severe refeeding syndrome we want to make sure that we're staying on top of that if the kid is showing any signs of refeeding syndrome like there's a drop in any of these labs you want to make sure that you stop any advancements in enteral nutrition to replete those electrolytes first so whether that might be like a bolus or like a supplement or some type of thing i leave that up to the primary team to decide once it's repleted you recheck the labs and then make sure that they're okay and then you continue on and the other thing is if a patient is starting to show signs of refeeding syndrome you also want to start them on thiamine as well and the aspen guidelines say to give two milligrams per kilogram with a maximum of 100 to 200 milligrams per day so this kiddo is probably going to max out at 200 milligrams a day of the thiamine and you want to continue this for five to seven days. These are the recommendations that I would give to the primary team and I may also go over some of these things with family as well, make sure they don't have any questions. But that pretty much wraps up this case study. I have a couple of other case studies on this channel as well as other dietetics content. Just look for the dietetics playlist. I hope that you enjoyed this video and found it helpful. If you did, please be sure to give it a like and subscribe and I'll see you next time. Bye.